uh, Dr. Jasek for six minutes, please. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses uh, for what you've had to tell us today. Um, certainly, I acknowledge the importance of indigenous knowledge. I'll never forget, I was a medical student in the 60s and 70s, and to my astonishment, I learned that oral contraceptives came from yams uh, based on observational knowledge in Mexico, in, uh, in the uh, indigenous population there. So, and as uh, uh, Mr. Lametti has said, um, big pharma has quite often taken advantage of indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, appropriated it and uh, changed a molecule here and there and uh, um, patented all sorts of medications. Having said all that, um, like Mr. Soroka, I'm really interested in how we can achieve this type of partnership that has been talked about by so many of you. So, um, Dr. de Gagné, perhaps with, from your experience, you mentioned one thing. Um, you're recommending institutions potentially run by indigenous groups and, and uh, so on. Is there any model? Um, Dr. Wrightson's talked a little bit about what she's doing up in the Northwest ter Territories, but are some provinces and territories moving in that direction? I, I think that the first model that comes to mind is um, uh, a program in law at the University of Victoria. And in, instead of um, taking what was uh, the, um, the, the normal stream of law at, at UVic, they created a program that was uh, uniquely Indigenous, so in, Indigenous law. Now, you think, well, how, how different could that be? Well, most of the difference is in methodology and how, how these things are taught. So they, uh, the uh, organizers of the, of the degree program would go to Indigenous communities. They themselves were Indigenous, often to their own communities, and get a teaching. And they would bring that teaching back to the school, and that teaching was a story. And then, then they would process that, sto that story with students to say, here is the story. What do you think this means in terms of uh, inter how it's interpreted? And what do you think this means in terms of law and policy? And so a lot of this, uh, a lot of this is, has to be done. Um, um, it, this isn't really particularly siloed. What it is is a, it's a unique approach, a unique methodology that honors um, the ways in which uh, uh, knowledge has been transmitted in our, in our communities for, for thousands of years. And so I, I, I think the only thing I can really caution, and, and this has been cautioned many times, I'm sure, is just to, is to avoid this sort of uh, starting with the Western lens and then um, uh, seeking to, um, to, to add in where you can um, uh, Indigenous knowledge as, as, as it's understood through a Western context. Are there other areas, uh, perhaps in health sciences in particular, where you see that kind of a model could be used, or have you seen it used? Yeah, I think it's 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 often used in uh, in health communication, so in indigenous communities where where those those cultural stories are still strong, that there's a, a way to communicate um, um, health remedies or or um, uh, through through this same sort of storying method to say here's a story now between the two of us, can, can we seek to dialogue a little bit about and how we understand this story and what it means for your health. And so in terms of the federal government, uh, you would suggest that the Tri-Council should be actively looking, funding uh, this type of uh, uh, knowledge, seeking, and uh, I think that speaks to what Dr. Wrightson was also saying, that uh, she had great difficulty in terms of her application having to go through a southern institution. So perhaps there's some uh, barriers there to accessing this type of funding? Yeah, I think there is. I think, first of all, for, um, in the accreditation process for, you know, what constitutes a, a university, that's certainly been Dr. Wrightson's uh, one, of, one of the hurdles there. But, um, um, yeah, I think, it, yeah, I, th I think that there's, there's opportunities here. And so uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Armstrong, uh, you've uh, alluded to some of the difficulties that you had in terms of the studies you were involved in. Um, is there anything that the federal government can do uh, to uh, enhance this concept of partnership, 
um, that really the sharing has to occur right from the start. That has to be the basis. Is there anything that we can recommend? One of the things that I was, the uh, reason I was mentioning the Anaukan Center as an institute of higher learning that's mandated by the chiefs of the Okanagan to, um, you know, make sure that our our knowledge and our language and our ways of knowing on the land are included in everything that they're working on, particularly the environment. Um, and I think one of the one of the issues that I you know was um, wanting to point out was that there does need to be recognition of the institutions of higher learning that's convened by by the nations themselves, by the indigenous peoples themselves. Um, in this work. So that may be a provincial, you know, policy, but um, I think the federal government needs to really rethink what First Nation lands and jurisdictions are about. Um, and I think that uh, when we're talking about our language and our continued use of our land, we are talking about First Nations that have been there thousands of years and that speak that language and that are using it every year. I'm I'm in my 70s. I've been out harvesting. My brothers have been out hunting and fishing every year of their lives. So so that kind of in situ um, understanding and science of our land is not duplicated in universities or by okay. any experts, even if they're indigenous externally. So that Thank really you. needs to be given policy. Yep. Very good. Thank you very 